Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to come to your city to speak, uh, to speak about London. Uh, I'm going to talk about strategies where we're using the 2012 Olympic Games to regenerate the east of London. Uh, and there are three very important aspects of London's Olympic bid. Uh, the first was that uh, the London Olympics was uh, built as, as a global event. It's not the London Olympics, it's the World Olympics. And it's around London as being a city where uh, everybody uh, can come to and enjoy uh, and fulfill their ambitions. Uh, the second aspect was around it being uh, environmentally sensitive. Now, I won't say sustainable because the Olympic Games is not a sustainable event, but I think the London Olympics would be the first attempt to produce a Games which thinks very deeply about its environmental impact. And the third and the most important was to use the Olympics to fundamentally change a very poor and a very run-down part of London. Uh, and it came as a shock to me when uh, four years ago I met uh, two planners working for the Dutch Ministry who were planning the bid for the Amsterdam Olympics in 2028, 20 years. Uh, I, I was surprised and they said, well, of course, it takes 20 years to think how the Olympic Games can become a part of the change of your city. So uh, I'm going to explain how we tried to do in six years what the Dutch are trying to do in 20 years uh, and how hopefully we'll use the Olympics to fundamentally change London. Uh, London is, is shifting eastwards uh, from its historic centre around the city of London and the West End. Uh, and although that sounds easy, uh, there's a good reason why the east of London has not developed. It's very difficult. It's the old industrial area. Uh, it has marshland, which is difficult to develop. Uh, it's a place where we've dumped stuff. Uh, these are some of London's fridges left in the East End. Uh, it's a place where we make things, but not in an organized way. Uh, it's a place where, in the past, when we've tried to do things, we've tried to plan it, often we've done it badly. Uh, it's also a part of London of quite extreme inequality. Uh, the red areas are the areas of the greatest deprivation. And to give you an example, if you travel the 10 metro stops on the Jubilee Line from the centre of London to Stratford where the Olympics will be, uh, for each of those 10 stops there's a difference of one year in male life expectancy. So, People in the red areas can live 10 years less than people in the wealthy areas. The, the history of the, the shift of London eastwards hasn't been smooth. Uh, it's been carried out by a series of big events. Uh, the building of Canary Wharf, London's uh, second business district, the Millennium Dome, uh, the London Conference Centre, and now the Olympics. These are attempts to shift the centre of gravity to the east. And if you go back, uh, even within my professional lifetime, this is what the east of London was like. And we, we've modelled it to show that between 1986, this slide, uh, in the 20 year period, there was a lot of development in the old industrial areas. Uh, between uh, 2006 and today, with the Olympics, and the build-out of some of the Mordock areas, a significant amount of development is beginning to move eastwards. Uh, and that's what we project what the east of London will be like. So it's a steady development, uh, but a development which requires a lot of uh, planning, and a lot of work to try and shift development interest. But when it happens, uh, it is beginning to reform East London. This is uh, Canary Wharf, the uh, London's second business district. Uh, this is a new residential development, or about 10 years old, with a new park in East London. So it is beginning to shift, but the, the really big challenge for the Olympics was to use the Olympics to drive that process faster 
and harder. And to realize this potential where we can reuse land that's contaminated, that's old industrial land, for London's growth, which means that we will not have to expand London onto open countryside. It's based on an idea that there are these two big growth corridors uh, to the east, out to the sea and the River Thames, and to the north up to Cambridge. Uh, and it's based on uh, the investment in new infrastructure. Uh, the links with the European Rail Network opened uh, to St Pancras four years ago. Uh, we're building the new crossrail to link Heathrow with the centre with the east. Uh, and the public transport system now works and is removing the difficulties of inaccessibility that East London had. Uh, but this is the day when we won the Olympics. Uh, I think a lot of Londoners were actually surprised about winning the Olympics. Uh, and the idea was to place the Olympics exactly there. Uh, the blue areas are the areas of greatest deprivation, uh, and those are the two growth corridors. And the London Olympics is deliberately meant to change the economy of this part of London. Uh, we have an Olympic master plan, uh, we have stadia. All of those stadia are designed so they can be reused after the games. Uh, this is the proposal for the main athletic stadium, which can be adapted from an 80,000 seater capacity for the games to a 25,000 seater capacity for athletics events which is big enough for us as a nation by just adapting it. And every building has a strategy to do that. This is the aquatic stadium from Zaha Hadid. The two wings are the 20,000 extra seating. Those were moved off the games and we have a swimming pool with uh, round about uh, 2,000 seats, which again is what we need as a country. Uh, this is the velodrome. I won't say anything more because Mike's gonna say this in more detail. Uh, but the velodrome uh, will remain as a home for British cycling after the, the games. Uh, and the white cube is the basketball arena, which will be dismantled and moved to another site after the games. In the back is the Olympics Village. Uh, that is now being uh, sold as residential for the period after the games. So the games was about reuse and about adapting the park into a different park, which would be a centre for the regeneration of this part of London. Uh, so, so that's all really easy, actually. Uh, putting on Olympics Games, it, you've just got to build it, open it and run it. But the difficulty is how do you turn a sports complex, which is actually very secure now, into an organic piece of city? And that was the challenge uh, facing us when we looked at producing the master plans to transform the games afterwards. And we went back to, to this. This is a very beautiful plan uh, drawn up in the 1940s. Uh, and in a single picture, it shows the character of bits of London and the uses. And we thought this is actually rather nice. If you look at the, the area there, we thought we would just see what would happen if you use the same graphic to demonstrate how the Olympics could become another piece of London and to do it effectively. Uh, so that's the, the plan, that's what the Olympics will look like, or it does look like now, because it's now finished. And that's how we wanted to adapt it into a piece of city. But the problem is that it's going to take about 25 to 30 years to do that. And to be successful, we need strategies which are phased and which deliberately think about how the edges of the site key in with the surrounding bits of city. And don't forget that these surrounding bits of city are some of the poorest and most deprived communities in the city. So there's some very, very simple principles underpinning the Legacy Master Plan. Uh, the first is to preserve bits of the Olympics as, as a memory of the Games. Some of the stadium will remain uh, and will be embedded into a new piece of city. Uh, the second is to 
think about this as a collection of new neighbourhoods. Uh, neighbourhoods with centres, very much a London uh, typology. Uh, and Mark will speak later about the importance of high streets as centres for communities. And thirdly, about thinking about how we improve the connectivity of this piece of London. So it's not an isolated uh, ghetto for the very rich sitting in a poor area. Actually, it's physically knitted in with the area. Uh, we have strategies about use, utilising open space and parklands, about exploiting the rivers of the canal systems that run through this area, uh, and then developing uh, a systematic approach to planning that produces the fine grain piece of city, which would be very, very recognisable to future generations as being a part of London. Uh, the first stage of this uh, is the transition period, and after the Games, there's a second master plan which details how parts of the park, parts of the buildings will be, will be dismantled prior to it being handed over to the City of London. And then there's a series of very, very simple phases, uh, looking at how we transform it, how we bring in early development, uh, and how we finally get the last bits of legacy. And one of the aspects of the legacy master planning has been to think about, very deliberately, about the phasing of the development and the approaches to achieve the integration of this as a new piece of, of city. Uh, that's a, uh, a plan of what the legacy master plan could look like in 2040. It won't look like that, that doesn't matter. It will evolve, it will change, we will adapt it. But it will be something which will feel like a piece of London. But we also, we then asked another question. Uh, it's one thing to build an Olympics. It's another to have a plan to produce a piece of city. But it goes back to this question of poverty. Uh, and the question that we asked at Design for London was, what difference will the Olympics make to, for example, a single parent on a very, very low income living there or living there? And what do we need to do to integrate these communities in with the Olympic site? And we produced a strategy called the Fringe Master Plans, not conventional master plans. Uh, the idea is to find in each of these six areas, each of these six master plan areas, 50, 60, 70 things that we could do which would improve the integration of the surrounding communities with the Olympic site. Uh, and produce a piece of city which is harmonious and which hangs together and which people feel, local people feel they own and they feel entitled to be able to go and visit and use uh, every day of their lives. And I'm going to use just one example of one project which we are now working on. Uh, this uh, demonstrates the, the severance of this part of East of London. That's the area of the Olympics. And this area, the old Lee Valley, uh, characterised by low-grade industry, by polluted uh, land, polluted rivers, uh, pose huge problems in terms of separating communities. Uh, this again is an old photograph showing the residential communities either side. But this huge swathe of industrial land, big transport barriers, and a lot of it contaminated. Uh, and the idea was to use landscape, uh, linked in with something called the East London Green Grid, which Design for London developed, uh, has developed over the last five or six years, and to use, to take the countryside into the city and to explore ways in which we can link up a lot of land, and to use landscape, not just to link the Olympics, right about here with the River Thames, but also to link side to side into the residential neighbourhoods. Uh, this is a piece of work by a small architectural practice called Fifth Studio, uh, who came up with the idea of creating a linear park along the waterway, uh, a park which links the which will link the Olympics to the river, uh, which is basically a pathway called the Fact Walk, the width of this room, but which finds its way into bits of existing leftover. Uh, sometimes poorly used open space and adapts them 
for new uses, new activities, manages them, ties them together, uh, designs them, and starts to create an experience which forms a connection through this part of London. Ending here, on the River Thames, where we can link up to the, the ferry boat services, uh, with a final position here, which is a dock and an air and a new piece of space on the river. So that's the immediate Olympic legacy. Uh, I'm going to talk over a slightly wider area here to project forward as to how we're trying to use the Olympics as this, as this like a chemi like a chemist, like a catalyst for change. This is the area of the, the Royal Docks in East London. That's Canary Wharf. That's the City of London, and the West End is there. So this, this, is, this is the really tough territory. Old dock land, old industrial land. Uh, there's London City Airport there, short hop European connections. There's an exhibition center there, and that's the, the Dome, which is the O2 music venue, which is in this exhibition. But a big question as to how we could get the energy of the Olympics, the Olympics about there, to sweep into this part of London where we have vacant land and we have transport capacity. Um, the Royal Docks is, is really big. This is just superimposing uh, or comparing Central Park, New York with the Royal Docks. It's just really big. It's a big bit of city to try and deal with. Uh, it has an awful lot of land available for development but it's always been seen as being just too difficult and too risky for developers and finance to move into this area. Uh, and when, as I looked at this uh, about three years ago, uh, I had a conversation with the, the present mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Uh, we were in the middle of a big financial crisis and there was a real need to try and diversify the London economy. Uh, the mayor had a desire to try and get the real benefits, regeneration benefits from the Olympics, and he was really worried that his political credentials as a mayor, on, as an environmentalist, were really weak. So, putting those together, uh, we came up with something called the Green Enterprise District. Uh, and this, the concept is to take the Olympics to take it down into the Royal Docks and beyond east into this really difficult industrial land and just say, let's just call it a green enterprise district. This is not a plan. Uh, this is what somebody in marketing will call city branding. Uh, we didn't produce a plan. Uh, we produced this very, very quickly in a few days as a concept. But then we, we just put this concept out. Uh, we took it to Shanghai for the Expo for the London Pavilion. We talked to a lot of people about it. Uh, and people became very interested in the idea that there was this virtual green enterprise district in this part of London. Uh, the idea is that globally, uh, this is in pounds, there's about 420 billion euros a year, is the size of the global economy in green services. And that's increasing very, very rapidly. Uh, London has a share of that. Um, the question is, if this is the area that's going to grow in the 21st century, how could a city like London capture the, the benefit? So we decided to create the conditions for a cluster of uh, green technology industry to go for high environmental specifications, uh, to consider things like district, district energy networks. Uh, and we also thought it would be very nice to have a kind of, some kind of centre, an exhibition centre and a research centre. And that was the concept. But I say, it's not a plan, it's a concept. And the concept was purely to get people excited about the potential of this part of London. And the idea is that as it grows, uh, land will develop, jobs will be created, uh, and the area will be transformed from a low-wage economy into a high-wage economy uh, based on the growth of green technologies and green industry and green research. So that's, that's the concept. Uh, the, the second thing, having come up with a story, with a brand, uh, we then asked the second question as to why London hadn't developed eastwards. And we came up with this formula that London government is, is fragmented. You have a mayor, 
who I work for. Uh, and then you have individual parts of London which have their own political administration. Uh, the Mayor of London uh, is a Conservative, that is to the right of centre. Uh, this part of London in the Royal Docks is uh, Labour, Socialist, to the left of centre. Uh, and there's a perception that the politics were just too, too difficult. So we said, well, if we can sort out the politics, if we can put the Mayor's land and the Mayor's spending power together with the planning controls controlled locally, then we have almost a, a development body, a development corporation, uh, without having to go through all of the creation. So we could create a virtual organization to regenerate. Uh, and then we wrote a very, very simple strategy that described in very, very simple language the story of what this part of London could be like. And I think to a lot of people's surprise, and possibly to my surprise, we got the Conservative Mayor of London and the Socialist Mayor of the local borough to both sign it and both commit to it. And therefore, we solved the political dilemma and we created a story at the same time about what this piece of London could be like. Uh, and the vision is really, really quite simple. Uh, is to regenerate this part of London, uh, to bring in inward investment, uh, especially uh, investment from the Far East and possibly China, uh, to use the Green Enterprise District as the brand, uh, to look for new jobs, to build the infrastructure, uh, and to try and link this with the communities so the communities locally benefit from it. Uh, and then we did the second thing, was rather than a conventional planning approach, we took a marketing approach. We marketed it, we spoke about it, we went to conferences, we went to exhibitions and trade shows, to constantly say to the development industry that the opportunity was here. We described it not in a conventional plan, but in very, very simple diagrams, just explaining how this area could change, what it could look like, if people got it right. Uh, we looked at the four things we needed to deal with. Uh, the first was to understand the role of the airport that sat in the middle of this area, to realize it, can, it does contribute to the economic benefit but it can't get any bigger or it will kill the area. Uh, the second was to rethink the balance between industry and residential, and especially how we use the river. Uh, the third was to think about the optimum size for the residential communities. And then we built an alliance of landowners. We had to spoke to the people who owned the land, and we got them excited in with the story, we've got them involved with the story. Uh, and from then, again, it becomes far simpler. Uh, it was about identifying the development opportunities. This becomes more like a conventional plan. Agreeing a common vision. Uh, developing it down into more detailed planning and zoning. And then finally, master planning and developing. But again, I stress, this is not a plan in a conventional sense. This is a story that involves the people who can change the area uh, to try and create a big alliance of landowners in the city to try and actually make change happen. How that change happens is very, very flexible. Um, and at the same time, we identified the small things we could do to try and make sure that change was good and connected the area together. Uh, so that was the, kind of the big strategy. Uh, and then some very strange things happened. Uh, Having launched this very, very general idea of green enterprise out into the world, uh, the chief executive of Siemens came to see the mayor and he said, I really want to be part of your, your green enterprise district. Um, and on that, uh, we agreed uh, to sell Siemens a piece of land uh, and they've developed a, uh, an environmental and research centre right in the heart of the green enterprise district. Uh, this was a complete game changer in London. This changed the perception. If something like Siemens buys this idea and puts hard money in, then there's a sense that change is beginning to happen. Uh, the second thing we did uh, was about now keeping, keeping the momentum going in East London. And that was to come up with the idea of one scheme which was so strange and so different. 
it would keep the imagination. Uh, and we came up with the idea of building a cable car across the river. Uh, the idea was that we had an international conference centre, we had just over here an international airport, we have a huge music venue, but between them is a river. So we said, well, well why not just span across the river using cable car technology to link this into the new business support core for East London? Uh, we put the cable car out of tender, Wilkinson there are the architects. Uh, it's complex because it has to go, I think it's 92 metres between the bottom of the car and the river at high tide to allow ships to pass uh, and yet because it's on the flight path to an airport it can't be any higher so it's threading the cable car through very very difficult physical constraints. Uh, this is the drawing, it's now uh, almost completed, uh, it started on site nine months ago, sorry, I thought do. Uh, the both towers are in place, the cables are now strung. Uh, and the cable car uh, will probably now be operating for the Olympics. It's very, very tight, but probably will be. Uh, and will be a huge addition to, to this area. But the cable car, it, it's a very efficient form of urban transport. It will carry 2,500 people per hour. That's 50 buses across the river. Uh, but it does more. Uh, this is a a statement of confidence in this area. And it's a bit like putting the biggest advertisement for the development opportunities in the Royal Docks on site before the Olympics. And then the final strategy we did was to look at temporary uses. Uh, again, the idea, keep on doing things, keep on moving the agenda. Um, we became very interested in uh, meanwhile uses, temporary uses, pop-ups. I think pop-up is a universal word. The idea of things which are very temporary. Uh, there could be all sorts of things. There could be farmers markets in Germany, uh, Sunday morning on one of the autobahns into Cologne. Uh, there could be pop-up shops or workshops uh, for temporary uses. Uh, there could be swimming pools or lidos on, this is an old car park site. Uh, transformed two years later the same site from a Lido into a nursery. Uh, this is a railway carriage on tracks which is uh, a consultation centre for a big residential development in Deptford. It's also a cafe and a community centre and a, at times a cinema. Uh, or you can do sort of wonderful installations, this is a flying green carpet in Essen. Uh, or small things, uh, just to change the way people use spaces in the city. And this is uh, a scheme that Peter Murray, who is behind this exhibition, promoted outside his galleries, New London Architecture, as part of the London Festival of Architecture. Also car parking, but for a month it became a park just by laying down turf. Uh, and this is another example. Uh, this is in San Francisco, a small practice called Rebar. Uh, the idea here is that you, in the morning, you come early and you put about six dollars in the parking meter. And you've therefore, you've rented the space. Whether you park a car there or lay it out in the garden as a gardener is entirely your decision. Uh, and it's a very, very nice idea of getting people to rethink how business cities work. This is a scheme in London, uh, a temporary uh, cinema called the Cinerolium. It was up for about six weeks, uh, then it moved to another site. Uh, temporary bars, uh, temporary activities, uh, but the interesting thing about temporary uses, which we're now using more and more in city planning, is that whereas previously we thought it's something you do because you can't do anything else, and then you do something permanent, actually temporary uses uh, are an opportunity to experiment, to do prototypes, to consult people and do things, and then make things happen. And some things become really successful and last, others stop and disappear. Uh, so, one of the projects has been to float in uh, a historic boat into the docks. Uh, we held a competition uh, for architectural practice to come forward with ideas with a big property magazine. 47 properties, 47 people came forward with ideas uh, and we chose some winners. Uh, this is one of the sites in the Royal Docks opposite the Exhibition Centre. And the idea which won for this 
is called the London Pleasure Garden. This is operated by the people who put on the annual big uh, music, rock music festival at Glastonbury. They're bringing the Glastonbury Festival, the music festival, into London for two years to have it on this site. Uh, this is uh, another idea on another site to build a temporary structure out of wood to house workshops, uh, cafes, shops, exhibition space uh, on the footfall from the main station to the Olympics. Uh, and the third idea was to get four old Thames barges, uh, steel barges, connect them and put a, a floating a swimming pool, a floating lido, onto into the docks uh, as part of that. Uh, so that's it. That, that, that really is supposed to take you from sort of really big conceptual ideas about London, big events through the Olympics, down through strategies, down into doing lots of things now. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Mark Burley, uh, my colleague, who's going to talk about the, the, the design for London uh, and how they do some of those things in a lot more detail to try and make the city a lot better and a lot better place to live. But thanks very much.